He came into the world, the world he created, fully human, fully God. But some people couldn't see it. He wasn't what they were looking for, born in a barn, no sword in hand, a man from Nazareth who taught us to take care of the least of these. He was totally unexpected, which is incredible because his people's own teachings were full of signs about him. He was, is, and always will be the one everything points to. But it wasn't just his life that people had a hard time seeing. He died, and then he came back to life. No one saw that coming. He suffered and he died, but now he is alive. And the depth of his love is poured out for all to see. Do you see it? We've been in a series uh, called Jesus in Plain Sight. And what we've been exploring is the fact that we see certain statements that Jesus made. We see certain statements that were, are called the I am statements. And these were seven statements that Jesus made that were referring to who he was, it was and is. And it gives us insight to where we can see him working, how we can see him working. If we don't know the voice of our Savior, at times in moments like these, it's easy to lose sight of where Jesus is and who Jesus is, where he's working and moving all around us. He's in plain sight if we know who he is, and he has told us who he is. And so we've, we've dealt with some of these, and we're going to continue. Uh, this week we're dealing with the, the door of the sheep and the good shepherd. Next week we're going to be dealing with the resurrection and the life. The week after that, we'll be dealing with the true vine. And then we're going to take one statement that Jesus said when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. We're going to take that I am statement and turn that into a whole separate series on Christian apologetics. And uh, we're going to be digging into that. I, I know these aren't normal Sunday sermon series type subjects in a lot of churches, um, but uh, it's a lot of fun if we're willing to grow, but I, I'm more interested in growing people than numbers. We are moving into a day and age in which we better know what we believe and why we believe it. We better be founded and rooted in the Word and have a strong faith, right? Halfway Christian is not Christian at all. We need to know who we are in Christ. So guys, I want to jump into this today. If you're here and you're a guest this morning, thank you for being with us um, and having church with us. Uh, we're glad you're here. Hopefully you're given a card on your way in. If not, if you could stop by the info center on the way out and grab a card and drop that in the offering plate or hand that to somebody with a badge and we'll send you a little information on the church. So guys, today I want to knock out two I am statements that have a common theme. And these statements are in reference to an, basically an illustration, if you will, an allegory to, that Jesus gives us explaining who he is in relation to us. In fact, a lot of his statements were very broad statements about who he is, like, I'm light of the world. These, this statement, when he says, I'm the door of the sheep and I'm the good shepherd, are very personal in nature. And they're very, they relate strongly to who we are. Now, in Jesus' mind, he would have known the hearers of these statements that we're going to get in in just a moment. He would have known that they knew what references to a good shepherd, what they were pointing to. He would have known this. Keep in mind that this concept of a good shepherd was not foreign to the Jewish believer. The person that had walked in Judaic teaching, those that had followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this concept of a good shepherd was not foreign to them. In fact, it was very central to their culture. Shepherding was a trade, and it was one that was done a lot. In fact, I would probably venture to say no one in here knows a shepherd. 
All right? You may know somebody that owns a couple sheep, but they're probably not watching them in the fields at night. Right? It's a little bit different. But at this time, there would have been a huge portion of our congregation that were shepherds. This would have been part of culture. And not only that, but they would have known the biblical references. They would have remembered that God had promised the Jewish, Jewish people that there would be coming a, a, a Messiah that would act as a good shepherd. So they would have known this was coming. In fact, if we look at Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 23, kind of, I mean, we're not going to use that whole scripture, but it kind of paints this picture. But if you really look at verses 22 and 23, it says, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be prey, and I will judge between the sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Now, the first thought to somebody that maybe doesn't understand the timeline here is, well, he was talking about David. Now, keep in mind, Ezekiel is saying this after David. Okay, He was referring to somebody in the lineage of David. We know that Jesus was referred to as the son of David. Why? Because Jesus was from the tribe of what? Yeah, Judah, right? Which This tribe of Judah was the tribe that David was from. In fact, there was times David wasn't even king over all of Israel. There was moments in his, his king, um, kingdom that he was just over Judah for periods of time. Okay, So we see Ezekiel pointing to this lineage of David individual that would be a Messiah that would act as a shepherd over the sheep of Israel. So then Jesus walks into this atmosphere of a bunch of people that were looking for a Messiah that was promised to be a shepherd over the people of Israel, and then Jesus walks straight into that climate and starts referring to himself as that shepherd. Keep in mind, this was not, as we've kind of established in the series and talked about quite a bit, this was not just loose words, that everything Jesus was saying was pointing to something. Jesus' words were loaded. When he said this, he knew the filter they would be looking through. He knew the worldview and that they would understand that his words had layers. They knew what it meant. So, Let's talk about some ways that Jesus plays out as a shepherd using John 10. So first, a good shepherd gathers. Okay, we're going to look at John 10, verses 1 through 6. And you can follow along in your Bibles, the screen, but also if you have the Bible app, just go to it, hit events, hit Canvas Church, and it has all my notes there as well. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A shepherd they will not follow, but they will flee from him. Sorry, a stranger. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, this figure of speech that Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus is kind of talking like he does a lot in some um, using examples and illustrations and allegories and parables and all these ways Jesus spoke. But in this moment, he's hitting a couple different things. He's referring to a shepherd and also a door to the sheep. Okay? Now, these, these play in the same way in a lot of ways, but they're also kind of a little unique in nature. Now, let's kind of zoom into the past, and what we'll see is a lot of times, she, shepherds would at night, especially during certain times of the year in which they were keeping their, their sheep out in the fields. When it would start to get dark, they would lead them at times into valleys or into crevices or places in the rock where they were surrounded by maybe a, a mountain or a hillside and maybe there was only one way in and one way out. And they would lead the sheep into these areas and then the shepherds would sleep at the entrance to that area. But then also in the same way, when they would lead them into maybe 
fields and other things that they had blocked off, they would in the same way stay at the gate. And if somebody was going to come in and steal sheep, they would have to come in a different way. And this is who Jesus refers to as thieves and robbers. That if you were going to come in and lead the sheep out, you had to get through the shepherds first. Okay, And this is what what this is referring to. Be it in a field with fences, you had to get to the gate and the shepherd would sleep at the gate. If this was out in the fields, then it would be maybe back cut into the mountains and they would sleep right there at the entrance where the sheep would have to come through them or thieves and robbers would have to come through them to lead the sheep out. So as Jesus is speaking to them, they understood shepherding very well. They also understood how God said he would send a shepherd to them. But as Jesus begins to speak, this would have been difficult because in a lot of ways... They didn't know his voice. This statement that we were just talking about in worship of, I still believe. Please understand, especially today, it is by faith alone. If we think we are going to backdoor into the concept of Christianity, we are, we're mistaken. It is through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved. Right? When, so if we begin to look at these things that we're, well, I'm going to come in the back way. There is no back way. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. No man comes to the Father except through me. We have to know his voice. I'm going to dig into that more in a moment. So um, we've had a, our family, we like bulldogs. And so uh, recently we had to put down um, a dog that we had had for a decade, Leah. She was a big American bulldog. And um, about six months ago or so, we uh, purchased a pit bull that uh, was going to become her replacement. I know that sounds horrible. Sorry for dog people. But we wanted them to live together for a while, rejuvenate Leah a little bit, and also teach Josie a little bit. We, we wanted them to live together because we knew when the time came that we had to put Leah down, uh, we kind of passed the torch, if you will. And so... Leah used to, and this, there were several times that she was kind of ornery. Bulldogs are hard-headed, and if you're not a strong-willed person, you know, don't get a bulldog. And she would get out sometimes and just run. And she's not little, and she was a little bit ominous. She's about 85 pounds, and when people saw her coming and heard her coming, she was a little scary. And there were several times Farah could not get her in the house. She'd call me, and I worked in Knoxville at the time, and she'd say, Nick, I cannot get Leah to come home, and she will not come in the gate or in the door. I could pull into the neighborhood and look at her and be like, Leah, and she'd come running. Why? She knew I was the boss. She knew my voice, and in her mind, it went me, her, my wife, and my kids. In her mind, that's what it was. She saw me as the alpha male. She saw herself as next. All right? So what's funny is that over time, she learned, we're finding it to be so easy with our new dog. Because she learned very quickly. Now, she still listens to me more because sometimes she decides she's going to run off. And my mom and dad who live way up on the other side, they're like, uh, you know, Josie's up here on our, you know, looking for cat food on their porch, right? And so there's times the kids will yell for her and she doesn't come. And they're like, Dad, will you come yell for Josie? And I'll walk out on the porch and say, Josie, come here now. And I can hear her running through acres of our land, right? And she's coming fast. She does better than Leah did, but still, she knows who the boss is. She knows who the alpha male is, if you will. And she comes running. It's in a lot of ways like that that we see that Jesus is referring to this one way in, one way out, the shepherd relation to the sheep, that there's this gathering that we know that the good shepherd will do. And Jesus is speaking to this, right? That my sheep know my voice. Josie knows my voice and she listens because of relationship. What's funny though is I'm harder on her than anybody else. I speak to her in a harsher tone than my wife and kids. The other day, mom, Josie, don't do that. And Josie's just wagging her tail. And I'm like, Mom, it's not about what you say. It's the tone in which you say it. 
And I'm like, Josie, stop. Right? She has learned tone. Right? There's a moment in which we understand that sometimes us knowing the voice and the tone of our Savior, knowing who He is and how He speaks. Because it's funny, because while I am harder on her, at night when it's time for her to go to sleep, she will always end up at my feet. She'll always end up at my feet. When she wants to play, she'll go around. But by the time it's sleeping time, she come and lays at my feet. Why? She knows my voice. I'm harder, but she also knows I'm the one that's going to take care of her. Now, there's a lot of things involved in this that we have to understand as Jesus is speaking. There's a lot of sting of this, my sheep know my voice. And I'm going to talk about that here a little more in just a moment. A good shepherd protects. Let's look at verses 7 through 10. So Jesus again said to them, because they didn't understand what he was saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus is doubling down in this statement now, saying, look, I'm the only way. Anybody else that's telling you they're the way is a thief and a robber. And if you come through me, you'll find life. And this, this is what Jesus is basically saying. See, now here's the thing. Jesus just isn't a shepherd in the way that leading sheep. He's also protecting sheep. Here's the dilemma. And I think we find ourselves in this a lot today. If we do not have a a sense of his voice and his leading and who he is, and we cannot gather with him, we also won't be protected by him. If sheep just went and did their own way, if you've ever been around sheep, they don't have any means to protect themselves. No means to protect themselves. They don't have they're not they don't have a vicious bite, they don't have claws, they're they're just kind of weak, dumb animals. And because of this, they need somebody to not only gather them and direct them and lead them, they need somebody to protect them. And this is why so often Jesus refers to this, that I'm the door. I'm the one that's going to lead you where you need to go and then stand in the gap. I'll stand in the gap and protect you. And if you're trying to get any other way, and anybody else that's coming in from other avenues is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus is painting a pretty vivid picture here. And he even says it to the point that through him, he will be saved. There's a protection that takes place in knowing the voice of a Savior, the voice of our shepherd, and knowing that he gathers and he protects. And that is through Jesus alone. He protects. J.I. Packer said, God has not abandoned us any more than he abandoned Job. He never abandons anyone on whom he has set his love, nor does Christ, the good shepherd, ever lose track of his sheep. Now, this is somewhat of a difficult statement at first because we would look at the story of Job, and in today's Christian economy, if you will, we would look at that, and if we knew Job personally today... We're like, bro, I don't know what you did, but you ticked God off. Right? There's this prosperity gospel that's being taught today that if somebody like Job went to our church, think about it. What if, what if Job was right here six feet from James? <laughs> He'd be, Job would have been the one to get covid Right? Job would have been the one to have all the issues, right? We, we know this. This was Job. And in our day and age, we immediately look at certain things and start blaming God, blaming the person, getting into all these situations. And we'd say, well, man, God just completely abandoned Job. Well, no, God allowed. Keep in mind, to some extent, God was responsible for what happened to Job. But it wasn't for the reasoning in which we would project on it today. God does not abandon his sheep. 
I could imagine if a sheep was smart enough to truly articulate and reason through a shearing, it'd probably tick them off. What is this guy doing? I wasn't naked yesterday, and I am today. I was warm, now I'm cold. What's, the, what's wrong with this guy? What kind of shepherd takes away from me and makes me endure things I don't want to endure? You know what? I liked the other shepherd a whole lot better. The, you know the one we used to have? This is the way it would work. This is the way we view things. Keep in mind, God never abandoned Job. In fact, in the long run, Job ended out off pretty good. But he had to endure some difficult stuff that I hope I never have to endure. But God did not abandon Job. We have to understand that God protects, that God gathers, but it is important. The reason that Job did not denounce God, why he did not curse God and die like his wife wanted him to, was because he understood the nature of his shepherd. And he did not. Now he questioned, and God even at times said, Whoa, bro, chill. But God never abandoned him. I think we have to be people that quit looking at circumstances and start listening to our shepherd. It's not popular preaching, I, I understand. But your circumstances aren't always the litmus test of the faithfulness of God. Your circumstances and how well it's going is not necessarily what is speaking to the goodness of our shepherd. But yet, this is how we've done it. Why? Because we've, missed, we've kind of taken the theology of the word blessed and we've screwed it up. We've taken the theology of what it means to be pros prosperous and we've screwed it up. God is good even if your life is not. Oh, man. God never abandons us. Guys, there's a lot of thieves that come. We see this, and we've always seen it. Some people would want to get up, and I kind of get, at times, it's humorous. You know, I've got friends that they see it as their lot in life just to point out every false teacher on the planet and share good YouTube videos, right, that take people out of con I, You know, I kind of, I shouldn't laugh at that, but at times I'm like, come on. Put your energy into fulfilling the mission of Jesus instead of feeling like you're his watchdog. But, but... With that as my disclaimer, guys, there's a lot of things leading us wrong directions today. And we have to be very careful. Now keep in mind, in Jesus' day, there were people that were false messiahs. In Jesus' day, there were people off teaching certain things that were incorrect. We see Paul, and a lot of Paul's ministry was correcting certain things after Jesus had ascended and the Christian church was on the rise. There were a lot of things that Paul had to correct within the Christian church to say, no, that's not it. It's about this and it's about that. And a lot of Paul's writings are correcting some of those things. So we can't be naive and believe that's not still happening. It just looks a little bit different today. And here's how, to some extent, some of the things, and I'm going to move through these really fast, but what false teachers could look like today in some ways. Some of those are militant atheists. I'm not talking about the person that just casually doesn't believe. I'm talking the one, you know, like the, the how can I say this? The, 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 the vegan atheist. The one that can't just be an atheist, but you have to be an atheist with them. Right? I can't just be vegan. I have to make sure you know I'm vegan. Is that completely politically incorrect? I mean, I think vegan's the only eating way that has its own bumper sticker, right? Be vegan, vegan, go for it. I don't need to know you eat only vegan. I'm not necessarily, because I like hamburgers. You can do what you want. But I've never put on a bumper sticker, hey, I eat meat. <laughs> hey, don't eat meat, fine, just don't need a bumper sticker for it. I better move on because this is completely going to take some. <laughs> this is not in my notes and I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm talking about the militant atheist that isn't 
satisfied with just not believing. But there's an angst in them that it's not about them not believing. It's not okay for you to believe. I don't believe, but the fact that you do believe makes you ignorant and closed-minded. And, and, and you must believe in, you know, flat earth and you're against science. Right? We, we've, we've probably known these people. I get an email from one of them at least once a week. We deal with these type of things. So not just a person that casually doesn't believe. I'm not talking about that. There's a lot of people in that. I'm talking about the militant atheist. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of false teachers today that suggest that we can save ourselves by means apart from Jesus Christ. Beware of any preacher that dons the Oprah show. Because I've not seen one yet say Jesus Christ is the only way. Listen to me. Jesus Christ is the only way. I just have to move on from some of these pretty quick. Advocates of religions that know very little about forgiveness. Guys, the coexist bumper sticker is, is fantastic in nature and thought and ideology. But what we have to understand is for the most part, it's not going to happen that way. And not because I'm looking to kill people that don't believe like me. I don't want to. In fact, I would rather love them and hope they come to find Christ. But not everybody and not every religion feels the same way we do. And I don't believe in militant Christians that want to basically say convert or die. I don't believe in that and I don't support that. But we have to understand though at the same time this thought that it's, you know, hey, we don't need the forgiveness of Christ. We can, there's many ways to the same God. False. And as Christians, we cannot believe that way. And if you do believe that way, you are not Christian because Jesus taught that he is the only way. I believe at times the thieves are Christian leaders who attract congregations based on maybe gaining the affections of people rather than pointing to Jesus. In no way, shape, or form do we want that to be that way here. L listen to me. I am a man and I will fail you. Now, I'm called to live above reproach, and I will strive with everything in me to be everything I need to be for my family, for my wife, for my kids, for my church. But I'm a man. You're not going to like some of my decisions. You're not going to like some of my views. If I work to get you to be attracted to me, this whole system fails. I don't want you to be attracted to me and drawn to me or some other figure on our stage. I would rather you be drawn and attracted to Jesus and anybody else that is making them the center of everything, I believe is a thief because it's all about Jesus. We could go all through a lot of be it Christian leaders, be it people that look at faith from a kind of all ways in lead to the same you know, direction and all these different things. We even see a spirit of antichrist rising in our community now and in our culture now. You know, and I, I know we have to be careful with certain things, but guys, when I listen this week and I, I listen to Don Lemon say the statement that Jesus admittedly wasn't perfect. Show me in scripture where Jesus ever admitted to not being perfect. Show me that. And some people will be like, oh, no, we now, why is Jesus even needed to be included in a conversation about Confederate soldier statues? And then to say, well, just we're just deifying Confederate soldiers. So you're now paralleling a sinful nature Jesus and deifying him to deifying slave owners? And we're letting this just fly by. Listen, that is the spirit of Antichrist in our world. Why in the world is that even being brought up in the conversation? That's anti-Jesus. And I won't entertain that in my home. Because it's false teaching. 
Jesus never said, hey guys, I'm perfect. But those around him knew him that he did not sin. We see in 1 Peter, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Hebrews 5, 9. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe. People that walked with Jesus and knew Jesus made these statements. In fact, if Jesus would have stood up and said, hey, I'm perfect, there'd be a problem. But those that walked with him knew him to be this way. We have to be careful because people that begin to teach certain things are thieves that are here to steal, kill, and destroy. The good shepherd sacrifices, John 10, 11. Through 18, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not know his own sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me. And I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now, if it wasn't enough to call a bunch of Pharisees and a bunch of Jews sheep and call himself the shepherd, he now has taken it to a whole nother le uh, level. I've got sheep from other flocks that I'm going to bring into this flock. Woo! That was difficult talk back then. What is he referring to? I know he's not talking about Gentiles and Samaritans. And there's only going to be one shepherd over these flocks because I'm bringing them in. What's he saying? And then he says, look, I don't lay down my life. You don't take it from me, but I give it. And just as I give it, I can take it back up. Jesus goes all in, right? If you've ever watched the old poker shows, Jesus just went... He went from being a sheep to, look, when you kill me, it's not you that's doing it. Woo! It's me. I'm the one that's going to lay it down, and I'll take it up again. Because it's by my authority. The authority I've received from the Father. Man. All in Jesus, right? The Christological force of Jesus' words here is powerful referring to himself as the Christ and leaving no room of what Jesus is saying. I, I want to dig into one thing real quick before I close. That there's, there's, there's something in verse 27 and 28 that seems very odd as Jesus kind of gives this illustration. And, and I, I kind of want to throw this up here. And I, said, I hope it's got everything kind of highlighted. Throw, to, throw that John 10, 27, 28. If, if you look at this statement that Jesus makes right here that we just read, and in verses 27 and 28, we see, Zoe, 27 and 28, um, when, when we see that, it says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Look at all those personal pronouns. You notice what Jesus is doing in this moment is he's basically saying, look, y'all don't do anything you think you're going to do. It's by my authority. You know, he's drawing separation in so many ways. But then when it comes down to his relationship with his sheep, it's ridiculously personal. With everybody else, look, it's not because you have any authority. You don't take my life. I lay it down. You don't do anything. It's because I'm going to do it. He's giving all these statements and this separation of all those things. But then when it comes to his relationship with his sheep, all of a sudden it's my, my, I, them, they, me, I, them, they, them, my. All these personal pronouns of this relationship between a shepherd that literally gathers and protects and sacrifices for his sheep. This isn't some mean God in the sky that's ready to strike down the world with pandemic. 
This is a God that loved us enough to step into skin and to become one of us and to talk of this kind of language. And when Jesus begins to talk about his relationship with his sheep, he says, I gather, I protect, I sacrifice. In other words, I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. They'll know my voice. And it becomes very personal. It's very personal. It's between him and them. It's not just this distant, aloof Savior. It's one that became like us and literally holds his sheep in his hands and says, they're mine, and they know my voice. And I love them, and I'll do anything for them. W. Ke uh, Philip Keller says this, it takes some of us a lifetime to learn that Christ, our good shepherd, knows exactly what he is doing with us. He understands us perfectly. He understands us. Guys, in a day and age where we are constantly looking for resolve and easy answers, at no point in Scripture does it give us a picture that we're always going to find resolve and easy answers. If you find that verse, please email me this week. Nowhere. But it does say that our shepherd will gather us, and he'll protect us, and he'll sacrifice for us. It does say that. And we have promises, and I'm going to end with this verse. In Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. And we all know this, right? This is popular. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And he begins to unfold this in Psalm 23 about where he takes us and where he lays us down and how he leads us and feeds us and cares for us. And it gives us a very beautiful picture of our present, but also a very beautiful picture of our future. And it's all summed up in this one first verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That is the picture of a good shepherd. Now, do we believe that? Do we pray this way? Do we worship this way? Do we think this way? Do we look at God this way? Do we look at the situations in our lives and then project them on God that way? Do we truly, or every time something goes wrong in our life, we're like, God, where are you and what are you doing? Or do we know that we have a good shepherd that is over us, that loves us and cares for us, and when we are in the, in the darkest moments of our life, it's not that he's not there. In fact, Psalm 23 tells us he goes with us. He didn't say that he'll make us avoid valleys of darkness and death. Just says he goes with us. But we've preached false gospel where we've said that Jesus is going to make everything easy and rainbows and unicorns and butterflies. No, in times of Jesus, there's times of suffering and lament and struggle and angst and tension. And the beauty of the gospel is that he is in the midst of the human condition with us as a good shepherd that walks with us, that never leaves us, that never forsakes us, that gathers, protects, and sacrifices for us. You will suffer. You will experience difficulty in this life. And that is not a reflection on the goodness of our shepherd. In fact, if we're paying attention, we'll see in the darkest moments of our lives, there with us. I can't, in a place of honesty, be a pastor and be a teacher that stands up and begins to say, look, if you believe in Jesus, everything's going to go good. Guys, I, I get it. That's a better way to grow a church. But I want us to be mature and strong and stable and built on strong foundations that when we reach the darkest moments of our lives, we stand in the midst of it and we say, God, I don't understand this, but I know you're with me and I know you'll lead me and I just need to hear your voice right now. That should be our cry in places of suffering and lament. So the question is, who are you following?
Are you following a shepherd that walks with you through those moments, that suffers with you, that his rod and his staff protect you? And are you just living from moment to moment, hoping the next one's better than this one? Guys, in the midst of these times, in the midst of suffering, we have to trust the good shepherd. It's okay to not have the answer. It's okay to stay in the middle. It's okay to, to pray and to seek the direction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Knowing that he is with us and he never leaves us or forsakes us. He's our good shepherd.